Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the room and welcome back to another panel. This one is an, an interesting panel for me because I experience it all the time. And it's called The Rising Cost of Travel in Europe. Let me introduce our panelists. All the way over to my right, Eduardo Santander, who is the executive director and the CEO of the European Travel Commission. Oh, you're right there. Yeah. Uh, you changed places on me. I, okay. Okay. But all the way over on my right, <laughs> is uh, Jose Ramon Bauza Diaz, who we had a chance to talk to yesterday from the European Parliament. Uh, to his left, there he is, Enrique, excuse me, uh, yes, Enrique Barra, who's city, city sightseeing tours, right, city tour. And to his left, Her Excellency Suzanne Crosswinkler, the Minister of Tourism of Austria. Nice to see you. And I've already introduced you. And to my immediate right, Secretary of Tourism of Portugal, Rita Marquez. Uh, so we start with the, the harsh economic facts of the cost of travel, which predate, I would think, and we, we all get into this, which predate the drop in the euro against the dollar, which predate the drop in the pound against the dollar. Uh, we're seeing this happening in many currencies around the world, whether it's the Argentinian peso or the South African rand or the Turkish lira. Uh, and yet, if we're taking a look at the popularity of, of, of the destination, it hasn't stopped your numbers. People have not stopped coming, even despite the rising cost of travel. Yeah, um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yeah. absolutely agree, uh, Peter. First of all, let me say that I don't like the name of the panel, because I think uh, the image of Europe as a whole is being jeopardized with this, with this name, rising costs, this concept. Um, and um, yes, we are talking about financial costs already mentioned, but even though um, our costs have been increasing, we know that after the pandemic, people want to travel, so are they coming back? We have experienced very repeated customers, and so that's good, it means that when they come the first time, they come the second time, the third time, they feel pampered and uh, and, uh, uh, and the and the hospitality maintains the same. So basically, my main message is that yes, everyone in Europe is facing costs, rising costs, inflation costs, electricity costs, and at the end of the day, these costs had to be in, have an impact on the price. But that is not um, avoiding people to come back, and Europe is still one, I guess, the most competitive um, um, continent as far as most competitive continent as far as tourism is concerned. And, um, and we will fight for that, that's for sure. Well, you know, you mentioned one thing which had nothing to do with the drop in the, in the power of the dollar or the euro or, the, or any other currency, and that's energy, yeah. right? Uh, we're seeing uh, them you know, reducing the number of time they light the Eiffel Tower now. We're seeing people cutting back on power in England. We're seeing it happen across the European continent based on all sorts of things, not to mention the war, right? So that's got to have a huge impact. Yeah, absolutely. You know, energy has a huge impact. If you are talking about an hotel, you know, costs, uh, energy costs may uh, represent 15% of the overall pie, the costs, the, co the, the, the overall cost pie. But, um, you know, because, well, I do belo belong to the government, so we have a responsibility here. And I would say um, uh, we can, we are addressing that. In fact, public policy is addressing that, as we did, by the way, in the COVID, uh, because at the time we had to inject a lot of money into the economy in order to preserve jobs. And that's why now we are in the condition to host everyone that would like to visit Europe, because the company survived with our help, of course, and the, the help of their their own uh, teams. That's that's for sure. That's a PPP. That's, that's, that's a very successful one. But going back to the energy costs, yes, um, what we are doing right now in Portugal, yes, we're trying to cap the prices, the cap the energy prices. So that's something that the government can do. We are always um, relying a lot on renewable energy, and Portugal has made a huge investment on that for a couple of years. So 60% of energy relies on renewables, and so in order to avoid, you know, uh, oil dependence. And um, also, we are investing a lot on greener uh, efficiency systems. So if you are a private uh, owner, so if you are a businessman or woman, and if you make, if you want to make investment um, on energy efficiency systems, on water efficiency systems as well, you know, because it's not all about energy, it's also about our resources as a whole, so water is included. So basically what we are doing is creating incentives to try to mobilize for smart investment. 
Suzanne, you and I talked briefly yesterday about the war impact on this as well. Yes, of course. Um, uh, I think um, right now tourism is in a transition phase. There is still a lot of trust uh, when it comes to tourism from all over the world uh, coming to Europe. The, the exchange rate is in favor for us because it's quite cheaper to come to Europe right now besides the fact that uh, Europe had to increase prices because of inflation rate and because of the um, dramatically increasing energy costs. Um, and uh, in some destinations in Europe, uh, like for instance in Austria, summer is quite, um, com if you compare it to other destinations, uh, uh, a cheap uh, destination, but um, the, the value you get, the quality you get for the price is um, out of form. You know, just to give you my American perspective, I, I, I tell my audience all the time, airfares not, notwithstanding, hotel rates notwithstanding, which can be adjusted, the basic cost of goods and services, you can't really adjust in, in, in terms of, of what locals will pay for a taxi ride or a, or a night at the restaurant or groceries or a tube of toothpaste. And so your actual cost of travel, may, while your cost internally may be on the rise, for your visitors, they may not. Yes, but what we see is that uh, the behavior of, of guests and clients are changing a bit. Uh, they want to travel. There is a real high demand uh, for vacation, uh, winter and summer. Um, city is coming back very, uh, very strongly right now. Also, we had this vacation um, travel um, outperforming much stronger at the beginning. But what people do right now uh, is um, thinking about um, uh, the length of stay or they change their um, quality level of uh, lodging. There is, um, and it's interesting to see because um, currently we had a, a research and the outcome was that luxury, is luxury and uh, low budget is performing much better than the mid quality level. And of course, I'm, I'm not aware there's even mid quality out there anymore. It's either high or low. Yeah. I think people, those who have enough money, they want to still, they, they, they don't care about the prices. They're not price sensitive. Yeah. And, and the others who really want are price sensitive, they now um, are using the big variety um, hotels in all the different regions are offering. So there is an offer for everyone. Eduardo? Thank you, Peter. I would like to follow up on what um, Rita and Susanna have just said. But you know, I think we, we have a misperception of what Europe is and entails. Even the title of the, of the panel is a little bit misleading. Europe is not actually an expensive destination. This we know, uh, we have empirically proved that. At European Travel Commission, one of the things that they do is you know, we measure perception of destinations. And de facto, there is like a mismatch between what people think Europe is and what it is in the end. Please enlighten me. Uh, and, well, one of the things that we have to take into account is the life cycle of tourism. Tourism is very old in Europe. And, you know, obviously because of the historical uh, backgrounds and developments and so on, you know, the cost of operation in Europe is particularly high in some destinations and even very, very high in some others too. That has to do with, you know, um, minimum wages, which are very high in Europe compared to the rest of the world, which is also fair. You know, it caused us two, second, two, two world wars and a lot of revolutions and a lot of human costs. Um, and I think that the life cycle in Europe of tourism, it's in a very different stage. I was discussing with Rita this morning over breakfast that our aspiration in Europe is no longer to be the first. Yeah. You know, we've been the first for too many decades and we know what it's to count tourists, to count hotel beds, to count the expenditure. For us, the quantity is no longer important. For us, it's obviously the quality, and now we are identifying how to measure that quality. And we were talking about this yesterday, about the changing metrics of the, of the actual tourism marketing playbook, about whether you're doing for the quality of the experience or the number of visitors. Exactly, but you know, this is a conundrum, because we can talk and talk and talk, but you know, whatever you cannot measure scientifically, it's not worth it you know, to talk about it. And this is what we're trying to you know, indicate, or such as uh, perception. Uh, what is the perception of the locals when you know, you're city or your place of your, your livelihood is affected by tourists? Or, you know, what is the, the waste uh, management? Uh, how is it done? What is it, you know, when we talk, 
we have this aspiration of becoming a greener and more digital economy in the next 10 years. This is also a vision. There is a huge vision in this part of the world. But our vision is just different. It's not better or worse. It's just different. We are using a different time in when it comes to tourism development. And we would love to share with this region of the world our experiences because we've made tons of mistakes, tons of them. And we've learned from them. And from them, we're still actually coming out. Um, so I think the, the, the question at line is not whether Europe is more expensive or not, it's whether people are more willing to spend money in that kind of product or not. And that's the dichotomy here because you have two things that are happening at the same time, right? The perception of Europe as not being affordable and people traveling more than ever and not being price sensitive. It is a question of fairness because the, the price is sometimes much more expensive for Europe than to other destinations because, you know, the margin, we live in a margin driven industry. This is a cake where everybody gets a little slice, you know, and by the time, you know, the local, let's say the Austrian uh, ski resort or, you know, the, the, the restaurant in, in Portugal sees the, 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 the slice is the thinnest of that. So you see in Europe, you know, we are famous for being, you know, pretty um, good in regulating things and trying to make it fair. Uh, but this is what we're doing now, you know, try also to increase the slice of the cake for the small and medium sized enterprises and for the people working in tourism and maybe reduce it you know, for the big operators or for the big enterprises and for the big corporations. And I think you know, the moment has come also, you know, to, to give tourism back to the people. Well, let's talk about that slice of the cake with Enrique. Well, uh, I would like to add, I agree 100% everything you said so far table but uh, yeah coming out of COVID and see uh, this little bit of uncertainty in the market I would not be that pessimistic as we can read sometimes and all that and also the most important thing I would say is that tourism the, the evolution of tourism in the last 20 years has been made and actually it has become from my point of view a need of the human being before, let's say, generations above us, uh, to generations above us, for them to travel, it was a luxury. It was very few people who used to travel long periods of time. Then later it became a new way of leisure. People start to travel a lot more to see the site, to take pictures on the site and all that. But now the change has been incredible to, instead of to travel, to experience things, you know? Nowadays, we live uh, we have everyone has a life with so much information, so fast, all the communication, so many things going on everywhere that travel actually, I think it should change the name. It should be the experience industry instead of the travel industry. Before, we used to talk that the speeding, it was a part of the travel industry, but today I would say that travel is a part of the, the experience industry because it starts from the beginning, from the moment that people are searching everything, from the people that the moment they are traveling and having the, the experience. Huh? So I think that need that humans have nowadays to disconnect from the day-to-day -day life and be in a different environment, have different experience, is gonna continue. That's and that's really know. driving, excuse me, that's really driving the numbers that you're seeing. Because, and I, by the way, I agree with you. People tell me that, oh, it's revenge travel, everybody's coming back. I think that's a little silly. I think what people have come to, to realize, even if they're not conscious about it, they're not traveling because they want to travel, they're traveling because they need to travel. And that, that's, a, that's a big change. And then they're going right back to what you're talking about, which is going from material things and goods to experience. Yeah, completely. And as a matter of fact, the, the biggest growth in the travel industry is being experienced, you know, that uh, sector. And I think it will keep growing. And now talking about Sorry. Yeah, the, the new experiences that we will be seeing in the next few years through technology and everything is going to change again the travel industry. You know? So it's a lot to come and a lot to see in the next few years. Jose, from your perspective, from the parliamentary rules and regulations, what do you see? You know, I, I, you know yesterday I told that tourism is not branded. What is what I'm afraid of? Because, for example, we had this decision about... Uh, Pandemic, we cannot do that. It's coming up. The war, the increase of the prices. But what I'm worried, really worried about, is the decisions that we're taking about about the politicians, about the government, about the European institutions. So that is what really affects to travel. 
Because if we put much taxes that we can afford, the price increase. The price increase at the very beginning of the chain, but as well, the other and the last point we spin back is the city, is the tourism. So we have to keep an eye on what we are going to do. Why do we say that? I'm, you know, in Europe, there are two things that every single day we are saying, green and sustainable. What's your name? Jose Ramon Bauza Diaz Green. Everything related to every single world is green and sustainable. I'm absolutely worried about that. I'm absolutely involved 100% about that. But we have to keep an eye because this kind of decision can put much pressure on the private level and they cannot afford that. Taxes, taxes, more taxes, more increment, more pain. This is very nice to, to get it, but we have to talk with the private sector because they have to pay for that. And the politicians, I'm liberal, well, you cannot. This cannot be a part of that. We have to be part of the solution, but we are increasing and increasing and increasing, taking decisions without the hand of the private sector. Thank you. The time. And this is the key sector. So we are talking about the war, we are talking about the pandemic, we are talking about the inflection, we are talking about the, the cost of the, of, the, of the fuel. We are not talking about the decisions. Green is fine. Sustainable aviation fuel is fine. This is my I'm reporter, that's fine for, for you. But keep an eye. Greener, it has to be as much as sustainable in the economic issue, but as well as sustainable in the environmental issue. No more one, the other one. Suzanne? Yes, thank you. I only wanted to add um, one or two thoughts. Uh, first of all, if we talk about Europe, we have to understand that Europe is a micro and SME-driven destination, which creates a totally different uh, challenge if you want to develop tourism experiences, whatever. And then we have, in addition, the European Union, just explaining that um, it is... Um, consumer production driven, it is uh, not always uh, driven by the needs of the private sector. So uh, those two challenges, those two poles of the whole um, discussion, which uh, of the whole understanding what means um, tourism Europe and the future of this tourism is the challenge we have to face in politics. And today I, I heard um, one of the speakers on the big panel saying that uh, there is a political will needed and not only an agenda. And sometimes I, I'm asking myself if in Europe right now if we, if we have too much agenda and not enough political will. Not in every country maybe, but in general and on Brussels levels I can see this. Well, Jose was talking about taxes and governmental action. Let's go pre-pandemic. So much of travel taxes was being levied against people who didn't even vote in those districts, right? So occupancy taxes, you're taxing visitors. <clears throat> you know, uh, those room taxes, airline ticket taxes, you're taxing travelers who don't live in those countries. We do it in the United States. So you rose to the occasion during COVID where the government stepped in immediately, saw they had a, a serious crisis financially, that's the PPP, right? But the PPP did not last forever. Now, we, now, do we go back to pre-pandemic, or do we learn from that? Enrique, yeah, I know you wanted to say something. Yeah, well, actually, I wanted to say something about what Professor Ramon said, because I love what I said. Can you speak a little closer to the mic? As I said, I love what Jose Ramon said about sustainability and the private sector. I'm a true believer in sustainability. Actually, we put the first hybrid vehicle worldwide in 2012 in Palma de Mallorca, and we've been always investigating and development for new emissions and everything in our fleet. But nowadays, for example, it comes to a very important cost in our p &L. So it's a cost that we cannot afford. Just to give you an example, if we're going to open a new destination with a fleet of 20 new vehicles, the cost today, the latest emissions, it would be around uh, 6 million. 300,000 per vehicle. But if we go into electric, uh, we are looking forward, we're talking about each vehicle is close to a million. So we will be talking from an investment of 6 million to a 20 million. So that's something that it would change completely the business model. The only way we can go 
and, and, and look for, for that sustainability in, in the company through the missions and everything is if we have some support from governments. Otherwise, or, or you raise prices. Well, it's not everything about raising prices. We can raise prices, but uh, I think also uh, the customer is not ready to pay today also the, 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 this difference in the vehicle. That's something that we have done a research and we can see that they're not ready to pay. So if we really increase the price, it's going to have a big impact in our PNL. Eduardo. Uh, it is a clear action incentive by a gap what we have. You know, you know, we of course, you know, there's some things that we cannot influence. You know, Jose Ramon and Enrique and said, you know, like external factors, you know, whatever it's COVID or it's war or it's, you know, the next crisis. We live in a festival of crisis anyway, you know, so we have to be uh, ready. But there are things that we have we can control, and you know whether a service, a tourism service, or a, you know a package or a hotel room increases its prices, is not so wrong as long as the quality doesn't is or goes in in the wrong direction or it's lower and so on. If you increase the price and at least maintain the quality, and this has been also measured by us, and you know the, the quality in Europe is very well maintained despite the increase of price, and people still extremely satisfied with the level of, with the level of, of service, then it's nothing to run. You know, in Europe, we pay a lot of taxes. Yeah, you know, there is a different approach to taxes here, but, you know, I come from Spain. Uh, Rita knows from Portugal. The taxes are also very much reinvested in tourism infrastructure. Or, you know, in the Balearic Islands, it's incredible. The infrastructure that you have is such, you know, like a this insular uh, territory, which has a high level of infrastructure, not only for tourism, by the way, because we do believe that better places to visit are the best places also to live. And this is where we have that dichotomy all, all the time in you know, every um, um, conversation about sustainability, about you know, the visitor and the resident. You know, the more you align their priorities, the better the destination will do. Both ways, you know, because people perceive that a you know, happy population, that you know, you know, uh, streets that are clean, that are functional, you know, good administration of services, that pays always off, and people will have to transfer that kind of, uh, of uh, spirit of the place, if you want to call it in, in a more philosophical way, to the visitor. And that's what people then perceive as loyalty to destinations. It's not the place, it's not the color of the water of the beach, it's you know, that kind of spirit of the place. Well, one of the unintended consequences of COVID was that when people did travel, they were essentially test driving where they wanted to live. Absolutely. Correct? And that's why you've seen so much movement in place. In fact, in places like Portugal, yeah. how many Americans are now moving to Portugal? A lot. You're absolutely right. You know, after the pandemic, I think our um, we maintain the same values, but our priorities shift a little bit. And you know, and now try to balance as much as possible the personal and professional life, and especially if you have the means to to work by your own or for a company that does allow you allows you to work remotely. You think twice about staying in the same place. Did that change your visas? Yeah, definitely. We, we created a special nomad, uh, digital nomad visa, by the way, um, in order to instigate and to create better conditions for those who want to live in the in the country, and um, it has been a success. So I ab absolutely agree with Eduardo because you know when we promote a country as a nice destination to visit, we should use our best assets not only to invite people to come once, twice, third time, three times if possible, but also to leave ideally to live and to invest because let me go back to the sustainability part i to to message on on that on that uh, topic I absolutely agree that sustainability and and the green agenda, the twin agenda by the Europe does not come with uh, with the law. You know, we so we might have you know nice regulations from the EU, but if the private sector does not is not committed with that, nothing will happen. That's for sure. So, uh, as far as uh, in the government side, we should have all the incentives to give them the means to continue their investment. And this is a work in progress. This will, this was, this is not going to be rapid. It's going to last a couple of, of years. And that's okay, because these concepts, the innovation technology is also is cha always changing. So we should keep our focus, but at the same time, you know, trying to, to understand this is a work in progress. So that's the first message. So there is, there is a responsibility at our end to create incentives to foster greener investments and more technology wise investments and all of that but um, a, a second message arises is that 
all of us, and I, and I mentioned to, to you yesterday, we were talking about that. In, in tourism, sometimes we say, oh, the, the Minister of Tourism is, does not have the power enough, you know, to guarantee that tourism is a force for good. And in fact, yeah, we were talking about that yesterday with Suzanne. And, and in fact, uh, all of us need to understand that all governments, all all of us are ambassadors of tourism. So the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Infrastructure, all of us are ministers of tourism. Because when we are selling a country, it's not a selling a, for you, Peter, but to sell to all the Peters in the world. It could be investors, visitors, and citizens also. But of, of course, of, then of, it's of incumbent course. upon you to talk to each other. Oh, that's... Because you're otherwise siloed. No, Suzanne, I thought you were going to say something when I was talking about yeah. visas. I like what she just said because um, there was once um, at the conference uh, the message to all of us in, in Brussels that every minister is also a minister of tourism. And this is the message which we really try to spread a lot. Um, and by the way, the, the visa system, EU is on its way to have a, an electronic visa system step by step, uh, hopefully within the next two or three years. I don't know the, the uh, time schedule right now. I don't have it. Um, with me, but there is a new system for uh, electronic visas uh, for visitors coming to, to Europe. There is. A, let me complicate the thing a little bit more, <laughs> because you know there. Are, you know, in Europe we created something unique, the European Union, and we're very proud of it. But you know, we also try to give competences to as many people as possible. So we uh, have a very fancy word, which is subsidiarity. In many destinations, the mayor of a uh, um, town has more power about tourism than the Minister of Tourism of the country. Just to give you some examples, probably. Um, when you, for instance, have, want to operate a new uh, sightseeing bus in a city, probably you have to talk to the city first before you talk to anybody. Uh, around, you know, and, and in some countries, you know, we live in, in a very complex um, system of, uh, of competences. And here we have federal countries like, you know, Spain is one of them, but we have centralized countries, maybe like Portugal, they have a little more more defined uh, strategies, like more top-down. And some other countries, like Austria, for instance, where also the regions have a huge power when it comes you know, to even infrastructure investment and so on. So see, and then we have Jose Ramon, you know, helping us day and night, in, you know, trying to put everybody not looking at each other and say, yeah, yeah, no, we want this, but you know, looking in the same direction, which is normally the, the problem that we, talk about fragmentation and moreover just a little bit more of complication okay there is now in Europe a huge asymmetry because some destinations obviously because they've started many years ago they have a different life cycle of tourism are confronted with many different problems like you know Spain my own country you know we you know tourism is pretty old there so it's very physical infrastructure a lot of concrete and so on where, where, where Whereas other destinations in Europe, you know, are just starting, you know, so and you know, their maybe their start point is different. Moreover, the the war, for instance, you know, some destinations are very much affected or were very much affected at the beginning. Some haven't felt a single um, change in their own strategy or in their own numbers and so on. So you see, how do we calibrate this? Is the 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 real game here, and how? Can we help you know those that are suffering in times and those who are winning in other times? You know, Peter, Jose. Yes, I have. I love to hear what uh, Rita and Susanna have said about that. Each ministry of each government has to be the ministry of tourism. I love it because in Spain we have some minister that they say that the tourism is the worst thing that can happen to a country. <laughs> you really said. Yeah. Our ministry has said that the tourism is not a for any added value. To your country. Look at that. Yeah. We are the second, the second country worldwide to receive people from work, wherever we are. First, France, second, Spain, 83 millions. So, if our minister says that tourism is not the best, you can imagine what kind of decision, what kind of a strategy, what kind of political decisions can be taken for that one who says that the recovery power that we have from tourism that we have. The first to get out from the, from the crisis is thanks to the tourism. You're saying, oh, that's it's good, not too bad, but we don't want to you. So the, the net that we have in Spain about the knowledge, about the infrastructure, about the private sector, about the uh, 
public partner, uh, public private partnership that we have done for several years, it came one of the ministers and said, we don't want you. And the president said, well, I will. So, so, we have to keep an eye because the European decisions are so important, so are, re are relevant in the kind of, the, the way of some of the, what to say, down level uh, European uh, member states, so that the way can be seen. So, one more thing, one more thing, we have to keep an eye. We are here in the Middle East country. You know how is the managing of the tourism here in the Middle East country? We are saying, oh, they have many money, they know, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but for me, it's one more important thing than all of that. For me, the important thing is not the budget. For me, the important thing is that they want, they know what to do. To. They have a perfect idea of the, of the future and what they want to, know, to do in the future. No, here, in Europe, in Spain, we are seeing the flies. Oh, maybe you can do that. We should do that. Ah, it would be better if we go there. Well. And me meanwhile, Middle East countries, they know quite good what they want to do. And going forward, going back, and they put it in a sack to give a present to the citizens. So, most of the decisions that we are taking from the member state government, from the stakeholders, and even from the European institution, we, we are very, sometimes we are very theoretical. We are looking at the figures because we think that we are the best in the world because Europe is the most beautiful place in the world. It is. Mallorca, the best. <laughs> the best. <laughs> Obviously, yes. But be, be careful. Be careful because it's not only tourism not granted. 10%, 12%, 15% of the GDP is not granted. There are something that we cannot take uh, in and manage by our hands. The crisis, the fuel, the pandemic, the war. Run decisions, take future decisions. And I want to be very humble. I would like to be very respectful. We have in Orbat many million people, many million employees that they depend on the political decision. And we are not keeping an eye on that. We are saying, we preserve the future. We want the best for you. When I prove some laws, and Rick and Oz, and Eduardo, and some of here, when I was president, is that we, we have to, to make that law, we have to, to rule that law and say, yes. President, we don't need your help. Please do nothing. You stay with us. So keep an eye to that politician that they know everything about the tourism. Everything about everything. Because I think the most important politician that we have to have on our side is that one is respectful, humble, and working with the private sector. If not, theoretical, we can make many books. We can send and sell many books. We have a library full of our name books. But we'll be alone, and the tourism will be bred, thanks to our. So keep an eye and be careful with the tourism. Thank you. <laughs> but I love it. So sorry, I know. I'm always have passion with so that. So we're going to go visit you in the Balearics, I know. We'll be invited. But most. But most importantly here, when, before we wrap up, what you bring up, and, and Rita and I were both reacting at the same time, you're a minister who said tourism is the worst thing, blah, blah, blah. But the numbers speak louder than that, right? The, we've had wake-up calls after 9-11. We've had wake-up calls after the economic debacle in 2008, after the volcano erupted in 2010, and we've had, and we've had wake-up calls because of COVID. It's consistent. It's provable, the numbers don't lie. So we, we have to educate those ministers just on the numbers. Yeah, uh, you know, we are talking about smart, smart decisions, but we should also talk about smart governments and smart uh, ministers because we, we saw it during the pandemic. Without tourism, um, we won't survive. 
that's that's for sure. And when I say we, it's not the tourism sector that's not going to survive all the sectors because the tourism sector has a huge um, uh, spillover effect across uh, several sectors. And we saw what happened during the pandemic, and I guess none of us like it, right? So um, I think that's a non, honestly a non, an, it's a non question. So we need tourism, we need to fight for it, and we need to be one of the most competitive industries in the world. And that's why we have to invest green, that's why you have to be smart, that's why you have to foster technology, foster innovation, and all of that with with the private sector because again without the private sector that's this is not going to work especially because what suzanne said 99 percent of our companies are smes suzanne i'll let you close it <laughs> yeah thank you very much i wanted to give you an example because this is exactly what our duty is as uh, responsible politicians for tourism uh, we are now uh, inventing a new funding system in Austria for the industry, which will be in place by uh, beginning of 2023, which is totally focused on all three dimensions of uh, sustainability. And also in combination with this, um, we want to have new KPIs about the um, ecologic, mainly at the moment ecological um, numbers about carbon footprint or eco-label existence. So uh, the, if you want to change something in Europe and you have the political uh, responsibility, you have to be really smart, as was just said by you, uh, because uh, without uh, being smart, you won't manage Europe and the industries. On that moment, I will thank our friends, Rita, Eduardo, Suzanne, Enrique, and Jose. Thank you so much. No se oye.